Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Jun Chen. I'm uh, currently at Duke University. I was at Columbia doing my PhD a couple of years ago, and then you know I was part of uh, Cosmos. I, I actually spent a lot of time working on building radio stuff uh, as part of Cosmos uh, slash Orbit. And actually, see one of the uh, full duplex radios. I think on top of I think that's Node 19-20 or something. So that was actually one of the the hardware prototype we built at Columbia, and then we integrate this full duplex capability into the uh, into the Orbit uh, research platform. And then uh, the second half of my PhD was actually building this uh, entire uh, optical and wireless test bed together with Yvonne, Ray, and, and, Dan, and Dan's um, team. And then uh, as part of Accord, I'm also representing uh, the, the National Science Foundation founded uh, AI Institute led by Duke University. We call ourselves Athena. We're working on edge computer technologies uh, related to networks and computer systems in general. All right. Uh, I think I, I don't. I don't want. I don't need to emphasize. You know why uh, intelligent optical networks are important. You can actually see this is entire, actually much bigger scale uh, optical network that connects uh, radio base stations to uh, data centers and also connecting data centers with each other. You can use multiple wavelengths to carry different signals. You can place your optical transceivers in different places to create this reconfigurable uh, optical network, which allows you to actually move traffic from one place to the other in an uh, intelligent way. And then on, on top of these uh, uh, communication networks, you can also enable many applications, some of which we're working on extensively these days, including uh, virtualized radio access networks, uh, including spectrum sensing and monitoring, uh, of course, mobile broad, uh, broad, uh, broadband. And then we're also looking to integrate sensing and communication in the, in the fiber optical layer, as well as in the wireless layer. And we, we, and we also look at how do we build uh, you know, SDM-based control uh, framework to actually enable uh, automatic uh, reconfiguration and optimization of these underlying networks actually across both the uh, the optical and, and wireless layers. Before I talk about the optical part, I, I actually want to go deeper into the two uh, three slides that Ivan went through very quickly. So this is actually some work that we've been working on as part of the SRC DARPA uh, Jump, uh, Jump 2.0 Center for Ubiquitous Connectivity led by Columbia University. And then this actually uses the, uh, the Cosmos infrastructure a lot. So basically we look at how do we make uh, millimeter wave networks more efficient. So basically in the last mile, we look at how do we form you know, interference-free uh, interference beams supporting multiple users, essentially moving the baseband but recorder into the analog domain by using subarrays as part of a larger you know, millimeter wave array to direct beams in a way that the beams are interference-free uh, uh, by nature. And then in the baseband, we look at how do we use heterogeneous compute resources, including CPUs, and ASICs, right, both coming from Intel, how do we partition the baseband processing across CPUs based on the uh, AVX Intel architecture, and also leveraging uh, uploading LDPs and decoding into the uh, Intel's ASIC to, uh, to further enhance the, uh, the performance. And of, of course, you know, if you look at the optical front hall that connects the base stations and the, and, and the edge data centers, we look at how do we actually optimize the lump spectrum of such an optical uh, front hall where we can actually co-propagate different types of signals. And for example, you can send uh, your baseband traffic as part of the uh, coherent 400 gigabits per second ethernet you can also send analog radio fiber signals for let's say wideband spectrum monitoring type of applications you can also squeeze in you know these fiber sensing signals which is a narrowband signal for sensing environmental uh, monitoring and then by placing these signals at different wavelengths uh, and, uh, and by optimizing the launch power we can ensure that you know heterogeneous signals can really co-propagate over the same fiber uh, <coughs> Uh, infrastructure. So you can actually see the connectivity, uh, the connections between the wireless network that we run on top of this fiber infrastructure, as well as some other services we can co-propagate and enable uh, at the same time using the same fiber infrastructure. I won't go into details here, but the idea is basically we can move the, uh, you know, move the digital uh, precoder from the baseband directly into analog processing uh, down by the subarrays as part of a larger millimeter wave array, and then we can basically push, uh, you know, users which are much more closely uh, spaced with each other to be able to, you know, to be able to serve, uh, be served uh, simultaneously by this larger array. And then this is actually more interesting. You know, basically we can look at how do we co-design hardware and software to re reduce the amount of hardware to be used for millimeter wave uh, baseband processing. And then we look at you know, the energy consumption perspective. You can actually run this, you know, FR2, you know, one by one, 200 megahertz cell by using a single CPU core plus a bit of an ASIC for LDP decoding. And you can look at the trade-off in terms of the processing latency as a number of you know, compute cores, and also you can look at the energy efficiency of such a system as you start to offload LDPs decoding into, let's say, a more energy efficient um, ASICs, you can start to reduce the energy consumption of the system as a whole. Right? And, then, and then both uh, 
project were actually evaluated using this IBM phased array, which are available here as part of the Cosmos test bed. And then you can actually use our open source software to actually implement this entire C++ based um, uh, baseband signal processing. And then with, you know, LDPC uploading capabilities into, into Intel's ASICs, right? So that's my, uh, that's the wireless side of my work. And then I want to come back to the optical part, right? Basically, one thing that we've been working on the past couple of years was basically with uh, Yvonne and Dan, we we'll build this reconfigurable optical uh, uh, test bed as part of the Cosmos infrastructure. Uh, this consists of, you know, a larger Hellion optical space switch accompanied with uh, smaller space switches, and then, you know, 20-ish uh, reconfigurable uh, add and drop multiplexer or rhythm units we got uh, from Momentum, from Juniper, and then we connect them together, and you can actually see this is, this is a photo of the Cosmos data center in Colombia. We have an optical rack here. These are all the uh, programmable optical gears. And then we have another rack here, which basically houses all the, you know, VM switches, storage, and also compute servers with GPUs and other types of computing capabilities. And everything here is connected to not only the, you know, the lab's walls with different distances, uh, with different lengths, but also connect to a 32 kilometer dark fiber that goes uh, from Columbia to downtown Manhattan and then comes back in the loop. We also have, you know, shorter connectivity to the city college, which are uh, campuses, which are, you know, 50, uh, a few kilometers away from the Columbia University, we can basically, by reconfiguring the underlying topology using dark fiber and also using fiber spools to allow us to actually emulate different types of connectivities between data centers and also uh, between data centers and, and radio nodes. Okay. So one thing that we did in the early days was basically we look at how to actually collect a large data set that represents the, the behaviors and properties of these urban doped uh, dope fiber amplifiers. So basically we take individual momentum uh, rodent units from the Cosmos test bed. Uh, every uh, rodent unit here has you know, two amplifiers, one at the line out port, it's called the booster, the other one at the line in port, which is called the preamp. But basically we look at how do we collect a massive data set that comprehensively represents the gain profile spectrum with uh, respect to these amplifiers. So basically we look at different combinations of channel loading configurations. We can load the, the optical spectrum in different ways, uh, and then we basically measure the input and output relationship and, th and then calculate uh, the gain spectrum as a function of the wavelength uh, allocation. Right. And then to give you a sense of how the data set looks like, you can basically take individual elements or measurement profile from the data set and you, pull, uh, you know, plot the gain ripple as a function of the wavelength. Basically, gain ripple means how much the measured amplifier gain deviates from the target gain setting. As you can see here, uh, the, the gain profile or the gain ripple profile as a function Right. Basically, for comparing booster with preamp, you can see a big difference there. But also depends heavily on the actual channel loading configuration you put on that particular amplifier. Right. If you look at the if, when you load a single channel at a time, the gain spectrum looks very differently from if you are loading up, you know, all the 95 channels as, as part of your WDM uh, band. Right. So basically, the question here is how do we actually use this data set to develop a machine learning based model that can accurately characterize the gain spectrum behavior of such amplifier? So basically, this is the first uh, open EDFA data set we collected over actually over 2,700 hours. We, we constantly keep measurements running in the Cosmos test bed for, for, for weeks of time. And now actually we publish this data set with very comprehensive uh, documentation. And then people can actually now use these data sets, you know, actually kind of define our own uh, data structure, telling people these are the configuration settings, these are the measurement results, and then people can pull this data in, in a JSON format and then start to use the data to come up with, let's say, newer or better machine learning models that, uh, that can actually characterize the game profile behaviors of these uh, amplifiers. We also did our own exercise, but basically uh, compared to the analytical based equation, the center of mass model, we look at how to actually devise a simple DNN model that can actually take you know, a set of input parameters, including the input power spectrum, right, the gain setting, the input power, output power of the amplifier, and also a vector that indicates which wavelength channels are, have been loaded. And then the output here of the model is basically the individual uh, gain of the amplifier. And then if you were to compare the performance between our you know, DNN-based model right in blue with this traditional analytical model, you can see on average our model has a much, achieved a much a better accuracy and also the variance in terms of predicting the amplifier gain spectrum is also uh, much uh, smaller compared to these uh, traditional analytical-based uh, models. And going back to the question uh, raised in the panel, we will also look at how do we further reduce the data collection time by actually uh, looking at transfer learning. Right? Basically, how can you collect a lot of measurement from one device, and then whenever, every time you see a new device, in this case, a new e amplifier coming in, 
you can collect very few measurements. In our case, we collect more than uh, 100 times fewer measurements on this newer unseen device. And then we apply transfer learning where it basically we freeze the first few layers of the pre-trained model. And then we free up the last few layers of the model and then we retrain only these last few layers parameters using the very few measurements collected on uh, from the new amplifier. And then okay, we can still observe very good performance if you're actually transfer learning the knowledge from one measurement, uh, one amplifier to a, to a new amplifier. So this was also one exercise we did in terms of understanding how do you take, you know, how do you actually uh, predict a uh, gain spectrum of a new amplifier based on very few uh, measurements taken from this, uh, from this new device. We also look at other aspects here, for example, how do we, how much data is actually needed to collect right from the new unseen device so that the model still works uh, reasonably well. And then we find out, you know, if you can uh, collect, let's say, maybe up to, you know, 1% of the data compared to the pre-trained model, uh, the data used to, to, to train the pre-trained model, then you can still get very good performance. We also look at how do we transfer learn uh, the gain spectrum across different gain settings of the same amplifier type, right? This is, let's say, you can actually uh, <coughs> push in the model from you know 18 dB gain and then use that model to transfer learn to a new gain setting that you know the model hasn't seen before. We also look at the transfer learning between different amplifier types, right? Basically transfer learning between the booster and pre-amplifiers uh, pre and also overall this approach uh, seemed to work pretty well, right? And then if you are interested in actually developing uh, better and more efficient uh, machine learning models, you can always you know take our data set and then and then go from there. Actually these are very comprehensive data sets uh, that people can already uh, use to uh, to actually benchmark and develop uh, new machine learning models. Uh, this is basically a summary of you know how different uh, methods perform. Right? Basically, this is the pure DNA model, which requires a lot of measurements but achieves the best uh, performance uh, accuracy. Uh, the transfer learning based approach, you know, it has slightly degraded performance but largely reduces the uh, data collection uh, data collection time. And then the tr traditional kind of mass model is basically uh, an analytical model. Um, that's based on uh, mathematical modeling of the amplifier behavior. And recently with uh, Dan and Marco's group, we also showed that uh, the Raman, uh, the transfer learning can actually be done using a single measurement, right? So instead of collecting still, you know, tens of measurements per amplifier, we show that using this uh, self-normalizing neural network, you can actually really take one measurement from the uh, unseen new device and then apply that single shot measurement on pre-trained amplifier models. And then the, the transfer learned uh, model for the new device can still perform uh, pretty well. Like this was a new paper, uh, actually not new now, uh, from ECOG uh, last year. Okay, and then one application will look at how do we actually apply these uh, pre-trained component level amplifier models into a larger uh, network setting. So here we look at the particular problem of how do we predict optical spectrum evolution across a multi-span uh, rodent network where you have you know an end-to-end -end optical path with multiple amplifiers along the way, you want to actually predict the power spectrum evolution, how does optical power spectrum evolve as a function of the, the, the rodent the, the, the rodent count count on the way, right? And here we set our experiments in the cosmos test bed. As you remember, we have a bunch of you know fiber spools here, we have the dark fibers, so we can basically create you know set of topologies that involve connecting the rodents and the fiber spools and dark fiber in different ways. And then if you look at the traditional ways of uh, estimating the performance of this end-to-end -end optical link, you can always perform end-to-end -end learning, right? Basically, you set up your end-to-end -end topology, you take a lot of measurements, you train a machine learning model end-to-end, -end, right? Basically, and then for any given new input, you can run your pre-trained end-to-end -end machine learning model and then predict the output, po output power. In this particular case, it requires, you know, fixing the topology, requires collecting a lot of measurements for this given topology, but the network itself becomes relatively simple, right? Because you are doing end-to-end -end, uh, modeling um, using a single neural network. And you can also apply an approach where you directly cascade many amplifier models, which can be analytical models, which can be your pre-trained machine learning models. Uh, and then the fiber spans connecting the amplifiers can be uh, measured from the experiment, right? We call this a direct cascade of amplifier models where we take the pre-trained machine learning model, which was described before, and then we insert right, this measured uh, span uh, loss, right? And then we put them together and then we can actually construct this uh, direct cascade model. And also we developed some other approach, uh, which basically tells you, you can also somehow take few measurements and then learn these uh, span parameters along the way. Right? Basically, without measuring independent fiber spans connecting the amplifiers, you can actually take very few end-to-end -end measurements, and then you can actually learn the parameters of these uh, corresponding to these uh, internal intermediate uh, fiber spans by use, utilizing these uh, few end-to-end -end measurements. That's why we call this cascaded learning, because we're actually cascading 
uh, not only this, its amplifier models, but also the fiber models itself is also cascaded uh, along the way. Right? You can also see the comparison trade off here uh, across various models. So coming back to this, this example, right? So we take measurements by construct, uh, constructing two topologies. These are all like five span optical networks. Some of them are using the fiber spools we have in the data center. Some of them actually go through the 30 to, uh, 32 kilometer uh, dark fiber link in Manhattan. If you apply this direct cascade model, where only the amplifier models are pre-trained, but the spans are actually measured uh, to be inserted between the amplifiers, you can kind of observe this uh, uh, accumulated error over the span index, right? Basically, uh, the error accumulates as you go further down your multi-span uh, rodent networks. Uh, however, if you were to apply our cascaded learning approach, we would take a few end-to-end -end measurements and use those measurements to correct or fine-tune your span model they can actually see that you know, the, the arrow doesn't get accumulated over time, uh, actually over the span. Right? Basically, you can show that uh, the arrow pretty much uh, stays uh, very, very, you know, very, very, very small, uh, even though if you're increasing your amplifier numbers and increasing your hop counts along, along the way. Right? So, and, and then also we show that uh, we really only need to take a single shot measurement. Right? Basically, once you set up the topology, you take one single shot measurement end to end, and then you use it as single shot measurement to actually learn the parameters associated with uh, with all the span parameters uh, in this multi-span network, right? And then also we apply transfer learning based uh, amplifier models as well. You can basically largely reduce uh, the, the data collection time by only measuring you know, one amplifier along this multi-span network, and then you perform end-to-end -end measurements to correct for uh, these imperfections um, in both the amplifier and, and fiber span models. And again, together with uh, Dan and Marco's team, we're we'll looking at how do we use machine learning to predict the Raman tilt of the fiber itself. And also we've been exploring uh, using you know, a multiple encoder decoder attention models to further improve the, uh, the accuracy in terms of predicting these uh, amplifier uh, gain spectrum. Right. So these are the experiments we did uh, within the Cosmos uh, team and also with Dan's and Marco's team. And then we actually also did a few uh, field trials together with mostly entity, okay, yeah, entity innovation and also NEC Lab in America. So basically, we look at things like, for example, how do we come up with this uh, measurement-based uh, BER versus OSNR relationship for individual transceivers, which you can then use to model the transceivers, uh, let's say GSNR uh, behavior in, in a multi-span network setting. We've also done this autom automatic WDM optical path provisioning work up again together with NTT uh, and, and, and NEC labs. Basically, uh, if you have you know, unknown linked parameters, which you know, the service providers don't want to release to the client, you can basically provide these, uh, you can actually use this probing channel to probe the spectrum in a given wavelength, and then use the probing channel's information to predict uh, what is the gain spectrum and also co uh, quality of transmission information on these other uh, wavelength channels, which you are not supposed to be able to, uh, to measure. But basically, this is one of the, the first demonstration of how do we provision optical uh, uh, spectrum resource uh, without relying on the in, uh, the in spectrum, uh, the, the in spectrum measurement uh, information. And then again, with NEC labs, we've done you know, a lot of you know, joint communication and sensing uh, field trials in the optical layer. We co-propagate uh, analog radio fiber signals for wideband radio applications. We co-propagate uh, distributed acoustic sensing signals. You can actually see these are the sensed vehicles and subways and construction sites uh, in Manhattan where our dark fiber path uh, goes through. And then also our, our radio traffic goes through these uh, 400 gigabits per second uh, bus funder uh, Hardware, right? This is basically the heart of the Cosmos test bed we use to actually run these uh, co-propagation uh, field trials. And then we can you can actually look at the paper. These are very complicated diagrams. But overall, we can co-propagate three types of signals. We actually actually allocate their wavelength uh, spectrum. We op uh, optimize launch power for each of them, and then we show they can really co-propagate along different types of optical uh, spectrum in this uh, study. And just one last slide here. This is one of the use cases we look at together with MTT, uh, NEC Labs America. You can actually use this fiber sensing interrogator device to understand if there could be potential unauthorized uh, access to your patch panels. Right? For example, you, you see some of these uh, jiggling wires here that represents you know, something's actually shaking the, the patch panels connection. And then you can actually, based on this information, you can, you can provision the, the fiber signals to be going through some other route uh, before the link is actually broken. So these are some of the use cases that we've been looking at together uh, using the fiber sensing um, technology. So at Duke, actually as part of our AI Institute, we'll be actually working on developing a similar you know, fiber sensing and communication lab funded by one of the NSF Eager Awards. We're connecting you know, our communication sensing radio gears uh, across you know, a triangle uh, 
uh, fiber network here. Actually, we've already got more than 150 kilometers of uh, field fiber. We have connectivity directly to our lab and also to our data center. And then we're starting to, running, uh, to run some of these uh, field trials again uh, in, in North Carolina. Right? So hopefully we can observe uh, some, something similar but something different uh, across the different uh, geolocation. Okay, with that, I'd like to uh, stop here. And then thanks, uh, Dan, for having me here. <coughs> Thanks, Andrew. Okay, so time for one quick question. Okay. When we talked about the transfer learning, uh, is there uh, an intuitive way or a simple way to understand scenarios where transfer learning work? You know, how close, the, how similar to the systems have to be? Right, right. So actually, uh, that's an interesting question because our finding was that you know the game spectrum heavily depends on the channel loading configuration, right? Which wavelength channels are selected versus not, and also what is the power spectrum for each of those uh, loaded channels. Right? So basically, in this particular case, we actually select the training set for the unseen device to be in a way that it covers quite diverse channel configurations for the unseen device. Right? If you were to only measure, let's say, single loaded channel, then probably that measurement data doesn't give you much information about the new device. Right? But if you start to measure a full WBM loading combined with a few, let's say, randomly selected channels in different bands, then that starts to give you a very good sense of how the new device looks like in terms of the power spectrum. Right? And then that's actually one thing we did. Yeah. And then we, we you know, actually, the, the most difficult part was actually transfer learn across the game settings of the amplifier and also across the amplifier type. Right? So if you fix the game setting, if you fix the amplifier type, then things seem to be transferred uh, pretty well. But once you start to look at different game setting combinations and also move from one amplifier to the other, then this problem, uh, this you know, process seems to you know, be more, more challenging to, to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.